Good evening, Greg. How you doing? I'm doing great, Mike. Yeah. What up? Uh, welcome to episode 14 of Inside the Sulfur Bath, is, right? Is it already episode 14? Is that true? <laughs> that means it's been. Are you joshing me? That means it's been 13 weeks since we started the show. 14. We took a break. But 13 because the first week we had two episodes in one week. Right. That's what I mean. You're right. It's <laughs> been uh, 14 <laughs> weeks now. That that caught us up. Yeah. It did. Yeah. So we're actually we're on the 14th now. episode is the 14th week. So every once in a while, we need to take a break and then make two episodes in one week. And then the episode number will always be the number of weeks we've been making the show. We could do that. That would be really cool. We could also just give up on that plan and take more breaks. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, or take really long breaks and then come back with like six episodes at once. Seasons. That seems... That seems um, I'd hope we don't get to that point very quickly. I don't want to have seasons where there's like a, a rerun season where mm-hmm. all you can watch are the reruns of Inside the Sulfur Bath. Mm-hmm. Well, it's kind of like that on the archive on YouTube now. And we talk about seasons, but it's like just collecting all this content. Pretty soon we're going to edit everything separately. We'll have each segment will have its own video on YouTube. And so stay tuned for that. You can watch the same thing you can see now, just in a different format. Edited. Take all the stuff out that that we didn't like. There are rules, apparently. So uh, what's new? We played the folk show last night, which was cool. Yeah, it was very good. Yeah. We, uh, We met a musician. Who yeah, we playing did. on the show today. Yeah, we met uh, this really great musician, uh, Ben Shapiro. He's yeah, uh, going to be playing live with us tonight on the show. Um, he's, uh, looking forward to that. He was around a moment ago, but hopefully yeah, he'll be here for the he's show. He's here now. He's in the green room. All right. And um, But yeah, that was a really great show last night. I thought it was cool. John Reed pulled it together with the audio. We did the engineering for it, and it was yeah, really it was, good. It was very good mm-hmm. sounding. Unfortunately, there wasn't the crowd that we had the week before to hear that. Mm-hmm. I think they would have been impressed. I think they would have liked it. But I think that was a good thing. It was. Uh, it allowed us to like have a very loose show, and everybody was very comfortable. Um, yeah. Brandon White played. His performance was really great. Um, you I f- played. I played with Fumio. Your performance was really great. Thank you. It was really. Uh, it felt good. It was really good playing with Fumio, and um, Brian Glover played as well. Yep. And they they had a great show too. So th- they might be on the show in the future on our show here now. Yeah. So uh, subsequent Fridays next week. Yeah, cool. We'll be doing the same thing. Promote that, yeah. Every Friday at Mama Joy's, um, which is right across the street from where we make this show. 1084 Flushing Avenue. 1084 Flushing Avenue. Mama Joy's. They have a Friday night folk night. It's good at any point, but Friday night folk night better. Yeah. It's true. And they have really good food there, too, and craft beer on tap and everything. Yeah. They had... um, Interesting that you brought up Mama Joy's, Mm -hmm. because they had this... this, uh, this creature in their backyard. Oh yeah, biscuit. Yeah, the which biscuit you, story. Which you have. This is the story about biscuit. A steak in at this point. Yeah, we do have a steak in the biscuit story. So, we were lucky enough to start this uh, kind of residency with Brandon and John and Roy, and Daniel at Mama Joy's, and um, there was this cat that was just kind of like lingering in the place, a feral cat, and it didn't have a home, and we took it in and we took it to the vet, right, and everything. Yeah. But in the process of doing this, we called around a bunch, like, oh, how do we? take care of this cat and you know is there what's the cheapest way to go about this like we're trying to do the right thing but we can give it a home but it needs mu- you know it takes money to take it to the vet yeah. and everything so just calling around and it seems like there are literally like a trillion you know feral cats in um brooklyn just like lined up like i think a trillion is the current estimate i think a trillion point two feral cats in yeah. brooklyn they, do, they don't have any homes, and they're well, like, yeah, you guys domesticated us, and now we're sitting here in the gutter. They just live everywhere. You know? They don't have specific homes. Yeah. They just live in Bushwick. Yeah, they're like, we grow at an exponential rate. Yeah. Duh. <laughs> and, <laughs> they're, they're like and, cat um, fungus. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, and, you know, there's, a, you know y- there's people that take care of them. So, you know, I, I've seen all around in Brooklyn, there's always that one person that will go out and give the cats food in the street. But there's an overwhelming number. So that's a good thing. But there's so an overwhelming number, yeah. So it makes it difficult number, yeah. to say, I'm going to And go they need homes. They need more than just, like, take my friskies share on Fifth Ave, you know, in the middle of the night. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, I don't know, tons of wild animals roaming Brooklyn. You wouldn't think so, but it's like a jungle out there. Yeah, <laughs> don't we? So... I mean, it's not like we walk around and see cats roaming. They they slip yeah, on they, they roam. things. But they're in backyards. They and roam and, uh, and they howl and, you know, they adapt to society. Moving packs. Yeah. But anyway, so the bar's mascot is now our mascot on the show. And, uh, yeah. Well, we um, can bring him on. But we we should bring him on at the end. That would be a good finale to be yeah. like, Here's and now, ladies and gentlemen, Biscuit. That would like, be oh, good. Oh, that's a cat? All right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's so small. Yeah. So he, but he's recovering. He's gaining weight now. He just eats and sleeps. That's all he does. Yeah, and he's really good at that. So, so, <coughs> so you were calling around different organizations. You were saying. Yeah, I called the ASPCA and called different cat shelters, 
There are one. There are, there are more than one hundred non-kill cat shelters in New York City and the and the boroughs, and that's just an astounding. And you call any of them, and they're like, "Yeah, we're full up." So this was before <laughs> you decided to take on Biscuit. Yeah, I was kind of like, "Okay, we'll hook him up for now. Winter is coming, and we'll get him out of this situation, and then we'll find out. a family for him or whatever." But. You know, now I got him home, and he he matches my desk, and he matches the computers, <laughs> and so he so might just stay. You know. He might just have to stay. Yeah, yeah. So if anybody's thinking about adopting Biscuit, I think, I think he might be called for. Yeah, I th- I think uh, don't even mention that now. Yeah. It's past that. So, well, good luck with that. Mike. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. And and joining your cats together. Which yeah, I that's that's the challenge is, is introducing two cats that don't know each other together in a domestic oh, yeah. environment and. This is Billy's studio, basically, and she's like, "What's up? What's going on here? Is this a another temporary change? Yeah. You know?" Or anybody who really watches the show would know who Billy is, too. Yeah. Well, we'll have to have that cat segment at some point. Maybe it'll be really good. It'll be the most popular fucking episode we've ever do they done. Have, do they have? Are there cat trainers? Could we get a cat trainer on the show? Um, do you, do you talk? We could to just cats? get somebody that likes cats and call them a cat trainer. A cat whisperer. Yeah, <laughs> like that actually literally whispers to cats. It's a little <laughs> creepy. It's like, hey, cat, it really works. Yeah. So tonight's gonna be a really cool episode. Uh, we have um, a couple of great really guests. Cool um, we also we already mentioned Ben Shapiro is gonna play live for us in a little bit. Um, uh, we also have um, Lisa McEwen. Did I say it right? I'm sorry. Um, she's gonna come on and um, talk to us about uh, speech act theory, and we're kind of unversed in that. So I, I feel like we're gonna get a little lesson. It's gonna be yeah. awesome, and share some of her uh, writings about that and and talk about that. And uh, also Justin Terry is here with us today. He's a really great painter. Uh, I've seen a lot of his work in the past, and um, just loading up some of the files we're going to share with everybody, uh, I realized there was a lot of his work that I hadn't seen, and yeah, really excited to l- go through that stuff and talk yeah. to him. As usual, I can't wait for the show. I can't, I can't wait for it to happen, even though it's happening right now. I can't wait, I can't right wait now. more than you, Mike. I, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm more excited. I, I have less patience than you do <laughs> for waiting for this show. Well, I can, I that totally might be true, but I think that. I'm going to enjoy it more than you. That might be true. <laughs> <laughs> you get wrapped up in not having patience, and then you, life just goes by. It does. Like, I'm so impatient for life to... Wait. It, oh, man, it, it happened. happened. It Jeez. happened while you were being impatient. Yep. But, yeah. So, moving on from that. Um, yeah. Cool. So, we're going to go into our first segment. Uh, we would like to invite Lisa McEwen out. <laughs> Inside the Sulfur Bath, episode 14. Thanks. Hi, Lisa. How are you tonight? I'm good. How are you guys? Yeah. Excellent. excellent. Yeah. Good. Oh, we were both <laughs> happened to be excellent. Right on excellent. <laughs> mm-hmm. Not misusing or overusing that word. We just both really are excellent tonight. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, excellent. Cool. So um, you were first introduced to me by Sean Randall at The Mantle. Mm-hmm. And Sean is a good friend of the Sulphur Bath. And um, we work with him. And he always uh, uh, allows us to get people on the show that really inform us. And it's really great. We um, definitely recommend uh, going to mantlethought.org and checking out all the stuff that's there. Um, I was looking at uh, some of your content that's there. Yes. And Sean introduced us. So, uh, yeah, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. Cool. It's great to be here. So, um, Sean originally said that you're a philosopher. Can you give us a little bit of your background? And, you know, we're going to talk about speech act theory. Yeah. Um, sure. Um, I wasn't originally a philosopher. I started out um, during my undergraduate degree at the University of Toronto in English and History with a view to sort of eventually doing theater. Um, so... At the end of my undergraduate degree, I applied to a bunch of theater schools and to a bunch of philosophy schools because eventually I sort of discovered that philosophy was um, what should be my major. But uh, So I got into a couple of schools for philosophy, and I actually got into a theater school here in New York, um, the American Music and Dramatic Academy on the Upper West Side. So I think my parents were the only history, only only parents in the history of philosophy, uh, in the history of parents saying, you know, go into philosophy, please, yeah, go right. into philosophy, <laughs> <laughs> don't go into theater. Um, but uh, I think actually, you know, theater kind of has helped inform my philosophical interests. Sure. So cool. yeah, I went to Edinburgh, and then I came to the New School here, and um, so I mean, just to give you guys a bit of background in the in the early 20th century of philosophy. Um, analytic philosophers were really interested in the content of language, right? What we might think of as semantics, how language refers to things, how I can say, you know, the word microphone, and you guys know that I'm referring to this thing, which, you know, seems to us to be really obvious. That of course, yeah. I'm, re- I'm re- referring to that thing, but um, philosophers, of course, are really interested in what's not obvious and the conditions for possibility, and they're really interested in 
in, in semantics and in reference. Um, but then, you know, in the, the middle of the 20th century, there was a, a philosopher by the name of J.L. Austin at Oxford who was like, well, hey, wait a minute, everyone. You know, language doesn't just say things. It also does things. And the kinds of examples that he started out thinking about were things like, um, as I was saying earlier, like the marriage ceremony, right? Um, you need to have somebody who's... Um, invested with a particular kind of authority um, and certain conditions in place, you know, people with a marriage license who want to marry each other. And, and when the officiant goes to say, you know, I now pronounce you man and wife, he's not describing something. He's actually doing it in saying it. And this kind of blew Austin's mind. And he was like, look at this aspect of language. Like, this is really interesting. We should explore this further. Um, and so he, he started thinking about things like naming babies and naming ships, where similar things have to be in place, right? You need a, a bunch of background conditions, um, people with certain authority in certain contexts, but, you know, um, you have these situations where people are doing things with language, not just saying things. And as he investigated it further and further, he realized at some point that all language does something, right? Even if it's mm -hmm. as simple as, like, stating or asserting or describing, mm -hmm. right? This sort of minimal end of the spectrum but you know it does things like question and you can undermine or you can disparage or you can compliment or you can seduce or you can order um and he got really interested in in what he called the performative aspect of language right so um yeah i mean this this kind of theory speech act theory gets taken up by by people interested in political political issues mm -hmm. so hate speech for example, um, speech act theory is a way to understand how hate speech works, right? Because people are, are really concerned a lot of the time, and rightly so, that you know, we need the freedom of speech. And you know, we really need to kind of make sure that people uh, um, have that freedom in order to kind of facilitate you know, the uh, currency of thought, in, in other words. And so um, when you restrict those freedoms, you really need to start thinking about why and what kind of argument you can make about why people should, you know, refrain from saying hateful things. So there was a lot of political and legal stuff that was written about speech act theory in response to hate speech, right? So if a white guy utters a slur, right, if he calls some guy the N-word, um, think about the conditions that are in place for him to be able to do that at all, right? Right. There's a kind of um, a history of, of hate and oppression that you're invoking and also condoning in that moment, which, you know, the victim of that slur just doesn't have recourse to, right? There's no history of hate against white people. Right. So I was saying earlier, there's, there's that example uh, with Louis C.K., who kind of jokes that, you know, I'm a straight white dude, you can't even hurt my feelings, right? You're going to call me a cracker and remind me of the time that white people owned people and land? Like, mm -hmm. that's not, it's not really comparable precisely because those conditions aren't in place, right? Um, and feminists take up uh, speech act theory in reference to rape culture, and also um, an article that I'm writing for Sean uh, at The Mantle, um, I'm really interested in speech act theory with reference to terrorism and the word terrorism and how that gets thrown around. Mm -hmm. So that's just a kind of background. Do you so guys have any questions? So speech yeah, act theory sure, yeah. is... Um, the idea that speech can do something or that there's the spectrum or is that all just part of the... the well, it's like, it's the, like literally the charging language with a certain energy. It becomes an action and not just a statement. Like right. you're doing e something. Exactly. There's a thing, there's a force that you're emanating. And you bring up so many different things. You know, I want to ask you about everything from... I want to ask you about the Blurred Lines video <laughs> and Diane Martell's take about it. You know, I, there's a bunch of things that you brought into my mind during that, but it seems like um, what you're describing also... Like Auden, for example, did he ever um, study like magic? I mean, uh, uh, to a certain extreme, what we're describing is taken out by magicians, you know, as incantations and making, you know, putting a certain force and energy and concentrating on putting that in a word. You know, there's a lot of extremes of this that um, that I think of in in, in mm -hmm. this. It's also, you know, used by politicians, and you get this kind of subliminal propaganda in every speech that's happening. Mm -hmm. And so you're, you're reminding me of this and, like, how much power and energy is behind that. And there's literally, like, you're watching a speech, but there's actions being taken. Right. And, there, and then it puts it in a different perspective, that it's like, okay, there's something about the power of language and the power of speech here that we... That 
it seems like this topic is really ripe for exploring that. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I think Austin, I mean, he, it's unfortunately he died shortly after he wrote the, these lectures, which is, mm. it's a compilation of lectures called how to do things with words. And he died about two years later. So he didn't get to see how popular <laughs> his, mm -hmm. his work actually got to be. Um, but he's definitely providing us with tools that we just didn't have before. Right. We get a little bit of that from Wittgenstein um, where Wittgenstein really emphasizes the use of language, right? That if we uh, want to understand what language means and what it does, we have to look to how people use it. But Austin also introduced this performative quality where language could do things. And, and you know, notice in the marriage ceremony, like certain people have the authority to do certain things that other people don't, right? Certain mm -hmm. people have the authority to use slur words or, you know, hate speech against women that, that other people just don't. Like there's mm -hmm. no recourse for mm -hmm. that. So it does tell us something about the power structures in society and the authority structures in society too when we see that some people can do things and some people can't um yeah so and and yeah you're right to say that that you know a sleight of hand is used in politics all the time right language is used to persuade mm -hmm. all the time right um sleight of word yeah <laughs> sleight of word mm -hmm. i like that <laughs> i want to start using that yeah <laughs> so yeah but when it comes to terrorism, right, this kind of thing um, really interests me because I it seems like such a problematic term to define. Um, and it, it, it's hard to define just on a kind of surface level, right, because it looks, terrorist acts look so much like either military violence, right, with bombings, or with um, criminal, just mere criminal violence, um, like with or you know, kidnappings. Or yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, you know, how, how do you distinguish terrorist acts from just military acts or from criminal violence, right? Mm -hmm. Like, there does seem to be a kind of political dimension to it. And, um, you know, different states have different definitions for it. So I think the United States definition of terrorism is something like, um, you know, uh, the threat of force or actual coercive force designed to um, manipulate governments into certain kinds of actions. Hmm. But... so. Media. Everything other governments do, right? I mean, yeah. <laughs> and as Chomsky himself like um, noted, right? Exactly what the United States does a lot of the time. Yeah. I mean, I think we've just been hearing in the news a lot about Syria and how the United States is using the threat of force to coerce Syria into certain kind yeah. of conciliatory actions, right? So, I mean, by their own definition, that's a terrorist yeah. act. Yeah. Um, so it can't just be the what, right? So then we think, well, is it the who? Um, so is it just that it's subnational groups that that target national? Um, governments and i mean that's kind of getting a bit more at it but it, there's still counter examples we can think of right and i mean we might jokingly say that the united states was founded by terrorists but there's still something about that where it's like yeah. oh that's not if, right if they had the it, word yeah, exactly. back in england when it was mm -hmm. happening they would have been like we got these terrorists oh totally all <laughs> over <laughs> yeah. the colonies we gotta get rid of them totally and from yeah of course from like an american indian perspective as well like, yeah you know, hardly, you know and so, and like we're talking about using this word and charging it, I, I think in my lifetime watching politics, the time that I've seen the best example of this is the mm -hmm. uh, Bush administration, the second um, Bush administration, second Bush. Um, George W. Um, using terrorism and, you know, mm -hmm. all of those guys on their cabinet. It was just like that key word. You know, there's all kinds of YouTubes on videos that just have cut together every time they've used the word. Exactly. And it'll just go for an hour. Oh, I should watch and, that. And, you know, bashing people in this idea and then getting the word and the idea in their mind. Mm -hmm. And like you're talking about, like charging it with some sort of energy where this isn't. That's a good example to me of what I picture I as you're describing is an mm -hmm. action that's taken. Yeah. And saying such a simple amount of things and the action taken is that is p this highly persuasive mode of controlling how people will react to anything else you tell them. And it's just yeah. such a powerful thing. And so advertisers and politicians and so I imagine there's a lot of think tanks that are very active in a uh, speech act theory and, and right. I mean, yeah, I would hope so. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, terrorism, I mean, I think of it as not just persuasion, but also a kind of like um, a different kind of performativity, kind of like, you know, going back to the naming ceremony or the, the marriage ceremony when the, when a government, deem somebody to be a terrorist, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I can call the U.S. or Trump's can call the U.S. terrorists all we want, but they don't become terrorists. Yeah. But when the U.S. all of a sudden creates this category of terrorism, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, we were attacked on 9-11. It was by terrorists. Okay, we've created this political category. Now we can fit whatever we want into it. Yeah. And all of a sudden we have all these political and legal loopholes that, you know, as a kind of 
means to an ends argument politically. Well, we're trying to combat terrorism, especially, I was talking with Sean earlier, the, the George, uh, the second Bush administration certainly used this, right? They, they used terrorism as a kind of blanket excuse for all these sorts of things, including a war on Iraq that, you know, now we know is about oil and the time we sort no of way. suspected, but... But, yeah. you know, um, but they were able to kind of file it under this heading and all of a sudden they were able to kind of do certain things politically that they wouldn't have been able to otherwise because they've created a category and now they can sort of call different people terrorists and kind of fit them into that category. Yeah. What I mean, what bugs me is that how openly absurd that we can all see that that is and yeah. still like it works, like they yeah. get that shit by. But that and also kind of pre- assumes that we are in touch with the all. And I think that, you know, here in here in New York, we have a certain perspective that we see, but the not the rest of the world thinks of the course. same way. Yeah, but just the propaganda, and you see, course, like watching course. mainstream news or people in my family, you know, sure. that I love dearly. That that's the only way they get their information is from mainstream news from the big networks, and exactly you look at that right there, and they're, you know, most of that I would say uh, a great deal of it is uh, an example of that kind of like there's innuendo behind the language. Yeah, and it, it's it's a deeply unhelpful, I think, political category because it obfuscates, right? Mm-hmm. It doesn't clarify anything. Yeah. It, it deliberately obfuscates so that the government can decide to, to do with it whatever it wants, right? And I mean, you <coughs> kind of alluded to Snowden earlier, I think, but like, you know, now the, the United States can kind of scream national security every time it wants to do something illegal. It's like, mm-hmm. well, yeah, that's a problem. Mm-hmm. And also, just in general, there's something I, I, I feel like, um, well, not to bring up, you know, magic and those practicing it again, <laughs> but the, there's something that Alistair Crowley wrote once about, like, the mind chattering itself away into nothingness, like, just the endless, the, you know, voices to him, like, chattering. Um, there's something about language, uh, I feel like, if there's, you know, there's the, uh, the sentence that's taken for what it is and what we accept it to be, and then there's innuendo... And then there's different things that can elude, like this charge language that we're talking about. And mm-hmm. people saying the wrong thing at the wrong time. Mm-hmm. It's kind of a weird thing. This isn't like the classic, like, good subject for a conversation. But, like, the, the moment where you say something at the wrong time and then there's this other context for it, you know, mm-hmm. it, it seems like there's this slippery slope until, like, is language a finite thing that we can abuse so much that we can just destroy it or something? You know, like, like the reservations, like you talk to a lot of uh, elder elder people, like my grandparents or something, and they, mm-hmm. you know, they're the type of language they use. It's you know very critical that you stay within a certain boundary, and right, um, yeah, because language has power, mm-hmm. right? Like yeah. Yeah. it really does have power, and so, um, you know, there was a, a debate last summer. Just to bring it back around to some political stuff that I'm interested in, um, but there was a debate last summer when you know Daniel Tosh made a rape joke. And um, and a bunch of feminists, including um, Lindy West at Jezebel, were like, maybe we shouldn't do that, right? And then all of a sudden there was this explosion mm-hmm. between comedians and feminists where comedians were like, ah, freedom of speech, we need to be able to make whatever jokes we want. And the feminists were, you know, saying different things. Um, but one thing that Lindy West was saying was, um, you know, make, make rape jokes if you want, but we should be allowed to stand up and say, that's a shitty joke. Mm-hmm. Because... It's not just a joke, right? The comedians kind of want two things at once. They want it to be just speech, but they also want it to be so important that they have to be able to make these jokes, Yeah. Yeah. right? So on the one hand, they're saying it's really important. On the other hand, they're saying, whatever, it's just speech. Mm -hmm. Well, no, words have real power, right? They have the power to condone. They have the power to normalize. They have the power to persuade. And behind that, I wanted to use this to shock you enough to pay attention or something. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it's a uh, it's a really contentious issue. Mm-hmm. But um but what's what's also interesting too is that um there were a lot of feminists who were saying, well, you know, censorship whatever, we don't need to censor, but we need we need to be able to say that that was a bad joke and um there was there was a a clip between Lindy West and some comedian, I forget his name right now, I apologize, but he was saying, well, you can't censor us because people kind of think in that dichotomy that if you're saying something's bad, that means we want to censor it. But we don't always need to think in those terms either, right? We don't need to think in terms of censorship or not censorship. We just need to be thinking in terms of like, well, other people have the stand up, have the right to stand up and say, I'm offended by that, mm-hmm. and here's why, yeah. and let's have a conversation about it, yeah, right? Because words are also a way for us to understand each other, hopefully, exactly. Right? If we can get past some of the like the elaborating barriers. and not having it be just a political correct thing, but like this is poor taste. <laughs> and this is really poor taste. Yeah. This is why you know. Yeah, for sure. And that that's of course never 
that's that's always uh, gets lost in the talk afterward. Yeah. I mean, the main offense is usually what plays in the media, and everybody overplays. Like, I love how the news always plays something like horrific or bad, or like, look the poor taste here. Uh, yeah. And then like show the lights <laughs> on it and show it still. Yeah. And then afterward, be like, it wasn't it poor taste. We're gonna show it again at eleven. <laughs> yeah. You know. <laughs> <laughs> and We're what are you showing it continuously? <laughs> on what's the channel? content here? Keep what are you really back. trying to get by? And yeah. that what you're talking about with language is also in in the sense of thinking about media. Um, it, it's basically this. Um, charging things with a certain energy like you're trying to pull something off and mm -hmm. so it's almost like there's the honest uh, outward face of it and yet there here's the manipulative like loophole that you could you know oh totally and so it becomes like by its nature is it it's fallible in this way of like can we really understand anything you know we've of course we're using a bunch of words somebody else chose for us yeah. to use anyway i mean it's it's hard yeah it's hard to get out of cliches it's hard to get out of the political jargon i mean right now i'm teaching a critical thinking class in uh, queens and we, uh, we analyzed one of Obama's speeches about Syria, and there's a whole bunch of, you know, there's an argument in there, but you have to just, like, scratch out all the extraneous stuff, mm -hmm. um, which is, words. you know, there's a lot of rhetoric, rhetoric in there about, like, oh, you know, as Americans, this is what we do, and this is what makes us different. And they're like, how does this fit into the argument? And I'm like, it doesn't. You're <laughs> kind These of words mean anything. <laughs> 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 it's not an argument, it's persuasion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you see so much of that in political discourse. Yeah. It's true. Yeah. Let's check out the Wall Street Journal so we can get the real deal, bona fide. Uh, and Democracy Now! Democracy Now! is awesome. Yeah. I can't advocate that enough. I, I yeah. Honestly, I just threw Wall Street Journal out there. I didn't. I was <laughs> like, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. um, no, compared to the New York Times or something. For that's sure, that's yeah. something that, takes, that took me a long time, like, you know, from the post all the way up. It's like so many media sources that call them the news, and you will get radically different things from different yes, you know, papers. Yes, definitely. Crazy. Definitely. Um, but yeah, so thank you so much, Lisa, for coming on. Do you have a thank website you. or something? Uh, you obviously you have some stuff on the mantle. I do. Um, I do not have a website, but I do have a Twitter. Oh, which, cool! A Twitter account, which is at Lisa M McEwen. So. And that's M C K E O W N. Correct. Yes. Cool. Good job. Yeah. Yeah. So and um, yeah, and mantlethought.org. I would uh, always uh, recommend people to go to there. Yeah. Thank you again, Sean. And you're you're currently writing, or you're going to be soon. I'm I'm on currently Mantle starting Thought. to write. Well, I'm I'm starting to write this um, article for Sean. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and also my dissertation. So all right, cool. which we'll see which one gets finished first. <laughs> right. Well, good luck <laughs> with both. <laughs> Thanks. Well, we'll look Thanks forward for having to both me on. Them. Yes, thank, thank you. you so much, Lisa. Thank you. Lisa McEwen, thank you. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, I think that was a really cool enlightening segment. Thank you, Lisa. Um, something yeah. that we don't always think about. So those things that we, you know, language, everybody uses it. It's what we do every day. Yeah. That's what I do every day. Is I use, a, I I use, use it every day, mm -hmm. all day long, mm -hmm. and I think about it a lot. Yeah. But I, th what I'm saying is I don't think about it very much. Yeah, well, I just, uh, I'm I, an advocate of thinking about it. It's a really great, um, mm -hmm. because I if it's the, how else do I talk to you, Mike? There's absolutely no other way we talk. See, that already confused words. me. Do you know what <laughs> I mean? That's the problem. I can't yeah. talk to you it's unless so I'm meta. using words. It's so meta. When you're talking about language, using language, it's so meta already. That it it's is tough. Like, you know, it is tough. How do you put your mind around like how language influences how we think? How do you talk about like, language How do you think language, about that? Man. How do you think about language with... Language? Do you think in language? I do. Like when I was in Italy and I was studying Italian, I was told like, oh, when you start thinking about thoughts in, la in that language, mm -hmm. then you really got it. And then I would just sit there and think Italian language and be like, okay, I got it. You know, and th I don't think that works necessarily that way, but. But, um, I mean, in, in a very interesting way, if you knew more languages, you'd be able to have different thoughts. Maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe. Or because like, a, like ancient Egyptian or something. Think about that with like a pictographic language where it's yeah. like you see a bird and it's like. Do you think you start do you think outside they in and hieroglyphics you, though? I like thinking hieroglyphics. That's what I'm wondering. Yeah, do you think in hieroglyphics? But I don't think that that was like a, a not to get too technical on uh -huh. it, but I don't think that that was a language intended to like give thoughts with. I think they were like counting stuff yeah, with hieroglyphics for sure. a lot. And uh, well, it's still it's track. fairly mysterious. What right. uh, you I, know. I think it was but Egyptian just, spreadsheets mm -hmm. though is basically what hier hieroglyphics mm -hmm. was. Yeah, I don't anybody, know. anybody have a, an argument on that? Sh I mean, we should bring yeah, Lisa back out so. here. We just got into a whole other <laughs> thing. Like, how does language influence the mind and how we think in my nightmares? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> because I have a lot of them. Yeah, about um, uh, Egyptian Excel. Yeah, about like, doing Excel in Egyptian <laughs> uh, pictographics. Man, that would actually be fun. That'd be a good way to learn pictographics. It would be. Yeah, top to bottom, and then like the pyramid. Right to left. Top to bottom to top. Bottom to top. I don't know. 
<laughs> so the pyramids might have been just a giant energy station. Oh, yeah? Crazy. That's where, gonna, that's going to be on a future episode. Where'd you hear that? In some books. Oh, yeah? And, <laughs> and these books they talk drawn, about it in Futurama a little bit, too. Hand-drawn pictures yes. in them? <laughs> uh, no, well, computer-aided drafting, I think, yeah. is what it was. <laughs> um, but, yeah, that was a, just, in general, a cool, a cool segment. I, I have a lot of comedian friends. I have a lot of philosopher friends and... Um, literature friends. I can think of my friends that are into experimental literature and stuff and yeah. fiction and, and all of that uh, oftentimes comes to the conversation about language itself. And, and again, it's like that thing, in the, it's like thinking of, you know, like air, like the oxygen, you know, like how, how many of us really understand how that works and we're yeah. already breathing and depending on it and it's the things that, you know, oh man, I've entered the cheesy zone, haven't I? I gotta stop. No. It's those things no, no. that we it never is. pay attention to that mean the most in life. And um, oxygen definitely means a lot to me. Right. And me la a lot language, too. too. Like I said, that's what I do most every day is oxygen and language. That's yeah. two of the main things. I use words every day. Mm -hmm. I use uh, oxygen daily. Mm -hmm. um, Can you turn that into a hobby and just water. not have a hobby, but just concentrate on your breathing and be yeah. getting just enough like be focus the best and energy? At breathing. Yeah. Like and you, it entertains breathing. you enough and you're into it enough that it, it gets your goat enough that you're just like breathing is your hobby. And people come to be inspired by your breathing. Yeah. Like, oh. <laughs> like you end up yeah. water skiing, but no, you're he, just he like, I'm out. breathing while on water skis. Like what? You, you know, <laughs> you like him do that. You like at Disneyland on a roller coaster <laughs> and you're like, oh, my breathing is changing now that I'm <laughs> dropping down a roller coaster. Right. So I'm going to, we, we should look into that. That also should be a future episode. And yeah, the Egyptology, and it would be great to get an Egyptologist on the show, right? I would like to learn about hieroglyphics. I think that that whole previous conversation we had would have been a lot more informed if any, either of us knew. Oh, yeah, that was just rambling in the darkness, what we were yeah. just saying. <laughs> but so, yeah. if we who actually knows got somebody that knew something or about an Egyptologist hieroglyphics, or a anyone who knows the source of pyramids. They call us out there, and we're also looking for um, an entomologist, too. Like, we want to talk serious ant societies, you know, They're really fascinating stuff. Maybe we could even build an ant farm on that show. You're going to have a professional or a specialist to actually talk about it. Otherwise, it's just me like, hey, look at this ant farm. We're going to show you. <laughs> ants are really Ant cool, farm man. picture number I two. I really like how these ants move and around. You see how there's tunnels. like a society of them going on? Um, Different so. jobs. Yeah, that's uh, what would our but jobs yeah, be if we were ants? Mm. Aren't most of them just workers? <laughs> I'd be right. a worker. I'm pretty yeah, sure I'd, I'd be a worker. Worker, <laughs> yeah. worker ant. Go do something. Okay. Yeah, go hunt for half of a popcorn. Go pick up that mountain. <laughs> no problem. A mountain popcorn. Okay, so we're definitely we've strayed. But um, yeah, language right, is so important. I, I agree. Language is very important to understand in a more in a more deep sense than we used mm -hmm. to just have fleeting communications. Yeah. Because and if you think a mm -hmm. lot about it, in mm -hmm. my opinion, you can communicate more things than the number of words you have to communicate with. Yeah. Well, and body language and everything else that goes into mm -hmm. communicating. And just playing with Fumio and Nick's been really amazing to me. Like, I really f am at the point now where I'm learning in this language, playing, improvising music with them, and it's you, you're having a conversation, literally. Yeah, you absolutely. get to the point where you feel that and you're talking, you know. And, um, and just all those great artists and, you know, abstract thinkers and uh, Dadaists, et cetera, that have specifically gone to destroy language and reach something new by, you know, tearing right. it up and, you know, Burroughs cut up method or something like that. And, uh, yeah, I, uh, having discussions like we had tonight uh, really um, put that in better perspective for me when I look back on that stuff. So, very cool. So, um, sh uh, should we go into like a third meta discussion about the interview? Mm. <laughs> like talk about that little so. section we, we talk just about talked about? the words about. we used. We can <laughs> nitpick them <laughs> like and um, get really into it. And if we were honest about how we, uh, how we said what we were saying. Yeah, we're doing that now, aren't we? Yeah. So cool. So uh, moving right along, we're going to switch things up a little bit. Um, we're really um, pleased tonight to have uh, Ben Shapiro with us. He's going to do a performance with us. Ben, do you want to sit and uh, let us talk to you a little bit first, or do you want to play? Yeah. Cool, yeah. Ben Shapiro. Do you, do you want to do a little, a little talk sandwich? A little yeah, talk and, yeah, I think come so. On down. Come on down. Cool. So should I be the bread or the bacon? Oh, no, um, you're good there. Uh, okay. Sometimes I like bacon on the outside, and you eat it like a... <laughs> It's just a messy. <laughs> What's up, Ben? How are you, man? Thanks for joining us. Yeah. Yes, thanks for having. Thanks me. for coming down. Cool. So we met last night at a, at a show we were all playing at, and um, you went on and you just blew us away with your performance, and we were like, "Hey, we're doing a show. Can you please come on and talk to us and stuff?" So how long you been playing, and uh, are you from New York originally? I was born in Gramercy Park, in uh, Manhattan, and I moved to Newton, Massachusetts, a suburb of Boston, mm -hmm. 
And I've been playing music for around 12 years, writing mm-hmm. songs for two or three. Cool. Uh, and before writing songs, you're just playing guitar, or what were you doing? I started with cello, actually. And oh, cool. I, and I played that for a few years, then I switched to guitar, and uh, I just took it and went shoink, because mm-hmm. <laughs> I thought it would be more popular uh, yeah. than cello. I think it is. Yeah. that's Wh- what When you're that age, That was course. my sixth grade mindset. <laughs> right. Um, do you still play cello today at all? Or? No, I've, mm-hmm. I've tried. And was it a hard switch? You were just like, fuck that, moving on? I Like emotionally hard? Uh, um, either, yeah. Uh, I, I, I meant like hard, like did you just drop it one day and just <laughs> go to guitar? Cold turkey, no more but cello. Was it difficult? Yeah, if there's a thing there to talk about. I can't remember. Yeah, I gotcha. If I made something <laughs> up, it would be, it'd be something made up. So I got gotcha. you. Yeah. yeah, cool. Yeah. I prefer that. that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right on, respect. <laughs> So, um, cool. And so what we saw you play last night, um, do you play a lot of performances like that? Or have you gone into recording? Or I recorded an album last year. Mm-hmm. I have some copies here for you, but oh, not oh, cool. you. <laughs> right. In the ether. Oh, cool. Um, if you even exist. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. And I'm working on recording some new stuff. And I play in the city. I play open mics mainly. Mm-hmm. Um, a show drags on a, a bit, bit long. Mm-hmm. Um, so I've been playing open mics, hanging out at Pete's Candy Store. Oh, I like Pete's. Yeah, cool. Uh, hosting there a little bit. Oh yeah, it's fun. Sorry. Yeah, we were actually talking about that recently, just trying to find a solid place that we could go to to do something like that. Yeah. Pizza. What what night do they do that? Pete's? Sundays five to eight. Oh cool. Yeah, come by. I'll be hosting tomorrow. Oh yeah. Make it fun. Awesome. Yeah. All yeah, right, Pete's is really great. Suck. They have good panini there too. Uh, oh yeah. They're panini. Yeah, they do. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's a, a staple of Brooklyn drinking culture and hanging out. Pizza's awesome. Um, yeah, pizza's awesome. So you're hosting there this thing now? Yeah, sometimes. Mm-hmm. Cool. Yeah, sixty bucks, for three hours. Awesome. It's yeah. all about the money, people. Yeah. <laughs> That's cool. And uh, so, wha- what's the turnout like? How? What's your assessment of the modern? Uh, s- um, open mic scene in Brooklyn. Like, how is it looking? <laughs> well, let me take out my notes. Um, <laughs> you know, it's okay. Yeah. I don't know. I'm very judgmental. And then I try to let my judgments, I try to detach from them. Uh huh. I don't really have much to say besides it's a happening open mic. Mm-hmm. Uh, people take risks up there. People are brave. And yeah. Do you I get a range of stuff? Is it like just solo acts or do you get like bigger acts in there too for it? And stuff yeah, like? yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. People come through from like New Zealand. It's like, what are you really? doing here? And they come specifically there, or they yeah. come here to New York and then find that. They say, "I'm gonna take a plane to Pete's." <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then they got a big outdoor area. And once we're done, <laughs> it's either that or it's over. We quit. Yeah. We're out of this. G- exactly. <laughs> exactly. And do you do you play with other musicians as well? Last night, what we saw was solo. When your recordings, do you have uh, other people you play with? I have a singer, a, a harmonyist, mm-hmm. harmoniist, harmonious. Right. Yeah. Um, They're great. <laughs> And yeah, I've played in bands in the past. I love playing in bands. I just don't want to like play with with just anybody. I'd like it to be with people who allow me to be as free as possible. Yeah, and that's hard to find if yeah, you're honest about it. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. And how did you um, end up playing with us last night at the show? Uh, my neighbor Ryan got me the show. He played oh, okay, as cool. well. So neighbors, if you develop relationships with them. It might it be just you. like friends. Yeah, you can yeah. use them to get to the next place. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. We should invite the neighbors over tonight. I have oh, I have a neighbor here. I have very unique. Oh, oh hi, this is neighbor. Kalindi. Hello. <laughs> cool. Not using, not using her. <laughs> to get to get to the next level. <laughs> yeah. After you. No, I'm I'm glad you covered that up. After you, it was pretty established. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Very cool. No, that's one thing uh, I gotta say. Is that, you know, I'm from California originally, and when I moved out here. In New York, it's like, you know, in Cali, you can get up in the morning, jump in your car, go to work. You see the people you work with, right? You see the people maybe at the grocery store. But in, since living here in New York, I've known so many more people just by meeting neighbors and living directly with other people, basically. And it's a lot of people, man. Um, yeah. Together. So a lot like of people. Women. Condensed on it's top of, of each other. Yeah. yeah. So, I, I mean, very specifically, very so. it's, it's uh, very unique to be able to come across so many great artists and musicians and like-minded people. You know, the population of uh, the people goes up so much, then the pop- the chances for everything else goes up so much, you know, and it's like... Yeah, uh, the chances know. for everything to be really super shitty goes yeah. up. Yeah, and also really super positive and... Uh, 
That too. Exponentially. There's just more of everything. <laughs> <laughs> There's yeah, more of everything. Let's do that. <laughs> yeah. That's a, that's what I think we're gonna do tonight. What we did a little bit of last night. I thought last night's show was really cool. We were yeah, talking earlier how there wasn't a huge audience last night, but everybody brought it. It was really it was good excellent. Show. Mm. Yeah. John did the sound great and it was very cool. Um, so hopefully we'll. I felt know. bad for all the people who didn't make it. Really, because mm-hmm. they missed out. Yeah, that's one of the shows we should have had on video for sure. So, yeah. um, do you, uh, do you have any specific influences, or um, I thought your performance was really unique, and uh, I was attracted to it. It felt like very American, but for some reason, you have this really great like. Uh, I mean, not to try to categorize it, just my own I- interpretation of it. You had this really great like old world England kind of Renaissance feeling to it too, even though it was like very modern folk music that you were singing for us. And I thought you were really cool at uh, how you did kind of these like abstract arrangements, controlling your modulation and your volume, just totally analog, just your voice and something that people pull off in the studio all the time. Um, I- is this a style that y- you've stuck to for a long time or is this... Um uh, it's been the past two or three years that I've been singing at all, mm-hmm. uh, writing songs at all. I began as a jazz musician rock and roll musician just uh, improviser and then i started writing songs um yeah so influences i i i come from different places like uh jazz john coltrane miles davis Thelonious monk to name a few uh then on the folk end like robert johnson woody guthrie bob dylan and then on the uh whatever else and uh like chopin um beethoven all these people i I just listen and then shit comes out um (laughs) yes absolutely (laughs) awesome yeah Yeah. and also to the world the world (laughs) is my biggest inspiration yeah god not really god um but like god god is such a word Mm-hmm. That doesn't mean much because a lot of religions, right? Language. Let's talk about language. I'm actually not going to play. I'm just going <laughs> to talk about language. Um, a lot of religions put a lot of different meanings into the word God. And there are some religions who will not even Wrong. say the word. They'll mm-hmm. refer to it. It's the unspeakable. It, it is. Yeah. I think that's specifically meaningful in that they s- don't make a word for it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The unknown. Um. Uh, has it started yet? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Ben Shapiro. was and what was comes now and there is no thing we are supposed to be then I'll bask in now to what was arises then I'll spit myself out or just let it be
dancing for the eye to see And so we sing, so we say So we sing, so we sing Well If we are what was and what was comes now And there is no thing we are supposed to be Asking now to what was arises, then I'll spit myself out or just let it be. Mind's attention, all the all the oxen free. Beyond the song inside, we're dancing for the eye to see. And so we sing, so we sing, and so we sing, so we sing. So we sing, so we sing So we sing, so we sing uh. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, so Language I think something that was left out was silence and its role in the development of language or listening. So uh, things arise from what? From no thing, right? Not nothing. Something to think while I sing a song about no thing. I haven't played this one in a while. all I know. Make the transition, enter being in the world. Yeah, I am a hell of a song is all I know. Now make the transition, enter being in the world.
to live for no thing Once I've awakened Beyond the song in empty space And before I know it oh, I bloom in wonder Now to live for no thing and decay You guys want to ask shout out questions or comments i feel like this is a space to do that even if i'm singing something and you really need to say it like say it i don't know why you would but the occasion may arise <laughs> thanks so now that my ego is a little bigger i'm actually gonna whip my dick out and slap it against my belly button instead of playing guitar. The light of the sun exposed And I fall to the ground in the form of a shadow Which reminds me of my connection to the whole By awareness of all Now to the ground my song will fall in a dream I had.
clouds the light of the sun exposed And I fall to the ground in the form of a shadow Which reminds me of my connection to the whole By awareness of all Now to the ground my song will fall Thank you. Thank you for your enthusiasm there. When you replace strings, they go out of tune quicker. Um, but you could just consider this a song. It's okay. It's okay. You know what? This, this calls for a different song. Because... already done and where we've come to the past is now gone may the words may the words of this song sing in here when the light is not strong the inevitable it is already done and where we've come to the past is now gone may the words may the words of this song sing in here when the light is not strong Sometimes we burp, and it's arguably not appropriate. <laughs> we have to deal with the consequences. Yep. It's who I was. There's no use in trying to change that deny it or glorify it. I've already glorified it, that's for sure. <laughs> the inevitable, it is already done. And where we've come to, the past is now gone. Oh. The inevitable, it is already done. And where we've come to, the past is now gone. Oh. This is a sing-along if you'd like. The inevitable, it is already done. And where we've come to, the past is now gone. Oh, oh. The inevitable, it is already done. And where we've come to, the past is now gone. Oh, oh, oh. The inevitable, it is already done. And where we've come to, past is now gone, may the words, may the words of this song, sing in here when the light is not strong. Thank you. It's good to be here. It's good to be in Brooklyn, playing for people who listen, you know? I've played so many places where it's just like chatter, chatter, and I'm like, guys, uh, this is important. <laughs> yeah. 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 How old are the kids? 19. 19, yeah. Hopefully, they'd, you know, they'd want to learn. You know, they'd want to listen. But, yeah. College is funny in that way. Most most kids don't do it. I would say. 
I don't know. Okay, more music, right? Music. Pup, pup, power. I wish I was I had DJ skills right now. Yeah. <laughs> All right. <nah. laughs> Observe beyond the song of mine till it quiets down. And all is still and time is gone and oblidah. A tree stands by a silent pond in a city park. Well, its leaves bloom and eventually fall. Every thought blooms and then falls So why do I worry about? Well, peace and love cannot be found When I insist on hanging on The leaf drifts in the air And lands gently in the pond It bloomed and now it's fallen Oh, sense ripples through the water <laughs> to observe beyond the song of mine till it quiets down and all is still and Time is gone, oh blada. Well, a tree stands by a silent pond in a city park. Well, its leaves bloom and eventually fall. Well, every thought blooms and then falls. So why do I worry? Well, peace and love cannot be found. I insist on hanging on And now to say The olden days are over And all the faces I have seen Are older between the songs well. I want to fall in love here right now well. to feel the world with my heart between the songs that make us who we are now from all the songs that bloom inside our heads to deny or glorify them is not loving so do nothing for a while to let them go
things that make us who we are now. From all the songs that bloom inside our heads, will all these things divide us and cause conflict? So do nothing for a while to let him go. I'm gonna take a sip of my beer and then. Thank you. Thank you. Is there a time limit or are we going forever? <laughs> okay, cool. Uh, one more. I could play one more and it's, it's going to be something. Uh, okay, yeah, I'll do that one. It's a whistle along. So if you like to whistle, um, you can whistle. Yeah. And please, please add whatever you want. Doesn't have to be what I whistle. I 
song Whose words were chosen To help me disappear Beyond the words that I sing there is no thing Love I can't explain Love I can't explain Thank you Very cool, thank you Thank you Do you have any history? Do you want to break down any of those songs for us? Is there any explanation or should we just take it as it was? And um, I, I guess they all lead to meditation Mm -hmm. Or mindfulness. Um. Yeah, you're singing about impermanence, and there are certain things that you that you you know put in there about the past is just gone. I love how you're incorporating like getting everybody to sing with you. It was like really good energy, good feeling. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because yeah, what's what's gonna happen? You know, what's gonna happen if we don't? make it happen um and and <laughs> and we have like to be we don't, and we have to be in the room we have to be in the room yeah. to make it happen yeah. Wow. yeah like if we don't participate what's gonna happen yeah yeah yeah, yeah. like yeah. nothing will happen nothing yeah and i love your song you have a song about no thing nothing nothing That's, that did just to me that was very that was you know about emptiness and something about like and i've always treasured like i love folk music i play folk music i have a number of heroes in the folk world like Something about Leonard Cohen at some point in his career becoming a monk <laughs> and living yeah. out in the middle of nowhere. And there's there's definitely like some lines to be drawn about folk music and the kind of insight that monks and Buddhist monks kind of like looking within and looking for. You know, I love uh, the classic Buddhist monk talking about the psychonaut versus the cosmonauts where the Buddhists, uh, oftentimes Tibetan Buddhists will say, you know, like Dalai Lama has said this, you know, why are we spending so much money and time and sending astronauts into outer space and... We should be sending astronauts into inner space. You know? Yeah, <laughs> into yeah. our minds. Yeah, people yeah. talk about the—I uh, forget what it's called—the something effect when astronauts look, you know, at and Earth. Oh, right, like looking yeah. back yeah. inward from out. Yeah, yeah. I don't know that effect specifically, but yeah, people cool. feel the oneness of all when they, s they see it. Oh, from yeah, that yeah. Distance. But isn't that possible? Here? Yeah, to space. You know, like we're what, standing what inside of it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's even better here. Like, yeah, we're closer. The astronaut, like, I'm dependent. <laughs> <laughs> closer, yeah. the, the astronaut, like, I'm dependent on oxygen. I'm this oxygen tank goes out, I'm fucked. Earth is beautiful, <laughs> you know. And, and people standing in a forest near a river, of like dollars and all duh. the time that went into that man. Yeah, all wasted. Yeah, yeah, For sure. Yeah, you mentioned no thing, which is something. Wait. Wait, it's something. Wait. It yeah, that's uh, that's always right. me. Yeah. <laughs> no, nothing, nothing. Um, yeah. uh, language. I, I've been reading a lot of Heidegger. I mean, it's good that we're talking about this language. is perfect. Yeah, perfect uh, language assembly of people on the show uh, tonight. Yeah. Yeah, Heidegger. Mm -hmm. I've been interested in. He talks a lot about uh, uh, words and and as as what make us human. What makes us human. And I've also been reading Hume, which sounds like human. <laughs> um, <laughs> And he talks a lot about impressions. And I've been trying to create my own. I've, er, I've been trying to figure it out for myself. You know, you can read all these philosophers, but to figure it out for myself and really yeah, exactly. experience it. And, oh, that... Align you know, it to your worldview and what you've experienced. And, and fill yeah. in the words, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no thing. Um, the impression of the world, the first impression, which is not... Uh, words create things. This is what Heidegger s argues. Mm-hmm. Um, and so when the words end, nothing, no thing may be, no thing may be. Um, and I think that's something to ponder. So no thing is something. Well, it's got a word. No, 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 no. It's, it's a to ponder. It's a, it's a pointer. Mm -hmm. It's a pointer word. It's a pointer phrase. It. Uh, alluding to something alludes. else, alluding to what it, its opposite is, basically, yeah. right? What it doesn't mention. Yeah. Well, great. Segway. We're just gonna take that moment there. So, is there a place uh, we can uh, listen to your music other than this? Yes. Show do right you have here? a, a web page or something people can tune in and hear Bandcamp? some stuff? Yeah, I just uh, I just made a Facebook thing, mm -hmm. and I call myself now Meditator. 
And um, <laughs> okay, yeah, you know, cool. it's 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 extreme, I think, but no one took that already. Meditator is. It also says Ben Shapiro dash Ben Shapiro, okay. so that you can search uh-huh. it more easily. Uh huh. S C H, not S H. S C H A P I R O. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and I have my album, a link to my album there. Uh, download it for free or just stream it. Cool. And uh, hope to get more music up soon. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. We will look forward to uh, new music and, you know, come back on the show again some other time. We're going to have a big absolutely. bash eventually where all the musicians come back. That's a meditator. I hope. Ben Shapiro. Yeah. All right. S C H. Yeah. Very cool. Ben, Thank my you. pleasure, man. A really amazing yeah. set. Really awesome, dude. Ben Shapiro, Thank musical you. guest. Thank you, man. Very cool. Thank you. So, yeah, that was really great. Um, really great. Episode 14, moving right along. We're going to invite Justin Terry out here right now. Yeah. And Justin um, is a friend of the Sulphur Bath and has been uh, hanging out for a while. And he has all these amazing paintings he's about to share with us. So we want to call out Justin Terry. How you doing, man? Good, how are you? Hi. Yeah, do you want to sneak in toward us a little more? Sure. Just uh, this, this direction, too. There's that whole, like, Mike. you know composition arrangement up. mathematically in painting you know we're trying to <laughs> exactly, what exactly yeah up a little. Space. back up a little you're, bit you're right in my way i can't even see justin i don't mean to. how are we doing now are we symmetrical justin how are you man i'm good how are yeah you? good yeah. so it's been a couple months since we uh first were talking about having you on the show yeah and we finally made it happen i'm glad yes um i saw you brought um a great deal of work to show and share with us yeah. and i'm a huge fan i've seen kind of your later stuff and the stuff you're working on now. Mm-hmm. And today you're bringing us kind of like the past, um, the history of Justin Terry as an artist, right? So yeah. There's a whole range of stuff here that I haven't seen before that I think is really great. Totally. Um, yeah. Um, where, where are you from and when did you move to New York? Can you give us your kind of a backstory and your history about how you ended up here in uh, Brooklyn? Yeah, I uh, grew up in Nashville, Tennessee. And mm-hmm. uh, then I went... I went to undergraduate in Colorado, in Boulder. Okay. Then after that, I moved back to Nashville for a couple of years, bartended, kicked around. Then I moved to Spain. Oh, really? And taught English over there. For oh, a that's few years. cool. Where yeah. Where were you living in Spain? In Barcelona. Oh, great. Yeah, yeah, I love Barcelona. Very cool city. Yeah, it was. I, I loved it over there. Awesome. And then I moved back to Nashville, and then moved up here in like 2004, I think. Okay. I've been here since then. Cool. Mm-hmm. And so you've been here in the city for a while. We were working together, um, is how I met you. Yep. And um, I remember, like, soon after meeting you, seeing some of your work, and I was really impressed by it. Mm-hmm. And um, you, so you work um, generally these days. You, you do abstract paintings, and I know you're commissioned for stuff. And you work, uh, I don't know if this is fair to say across the board, but you work large, right? A lot of the stuff I've seen of your stuff has uh, been uh, pretty large. It's really different sizes. A lot of people, mm-hmm. yeah, so... Some of it's the biggest I've done is probably like eight foot paintings, but Mm -hmm. I do a lot of small work too. And I think a lot of times when people look at abstraction, when they're looking at it on a computer or like a screen, they envision it to be really big, but not all of it. That's probably exactly what I was doing. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. yeah. Some of those were like 50 feet in (laughs) diameter, (laughs) weren't they? They were amazing. I I would They towered over my apartment. the biggest camera in the world to take a picture (laughs) of this. Yeah. (laughs) 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 And um, so you have a show coming up as well, uh, right? Yes, I do. It is in um, December. Um, Is it here in Brooklyn or where is it? It's in Manhattan at a place called St. Peter's Church. Uh, At an actual church? I believe so it's it's interesting like i'm not religious at all but it's like uh i think it's this jazz ministry place Mm -hmm. where they have a lot of arts and music and stuff like that and it's uh i believe it's like 54th and park or maybe okay and when is that is that going on for a while or is it um it'll be up for two months Mm -hmm. starting like mid-december i think december 16th cool to start St. Peter's Church. That's interesting. Have you been to the location yet? Um, I haven't yet. Yeah. There's a lot of churches and cathedrals in New York, (laughs) right, that have become uh, event venues and galleries. And it's very interesting to me that you can suddenly... I I saw... um, Who's the singer in Destiny's Child that's not Beyonce? Oh. (laughs) That's the worst way. She's Kelly Rowland. Yes. I saw her perform live in a church at a show that was awesome. 
cool. It's probably the worst way to prep, like <laughs> saying her name. Like that's the one thing that's. Like, Let me flatter you by. Why saying, do people always say that? Like <laughs> the one that's not Beyonce. Oh man. The one. That she's. I actually, but I saw her live, and I was like, she's way better than Beyonce. What happened? Yeah. It's. She uh, just didn't have the PR team. The PR know? team and the family and the Illuminati right. apparently. Oh really? <laughs> um, apparently, the Illuminati is really vested into hip hop and R and B music and these days. And Beyonce's really? relationship. Like. Whoa, it, was that the tangent alarm? I don't know. <laughs> <Is it turned>? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, just Jay-Z doing all the, you know. The, oh, yeah. They're playing up off of that shit a lot. You know, right. him and him and Beyonce both have like a biopic about themselves coming out this summer. I'm sure they do. Last yeah. summer, next summer, well, during summer. They'll probably summer. have one every summer. Every summer. <laughs> about yeah. the This is the <laughs> update <laughs> of how Jay-Z's <laughs> life is. And <laughs> I'll totally episode. be there. Um, very cool. So, um, and you do commission work too, right? You do uh, stuff in like hotels yeah, and galleries I, and when it comes by. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, I did just do two paintings that I think are. I hope they're going over to China, to like some. Oh, cool. I don't even know where they're going, honestly. But it was like a corporation, or how did you? I think it's like a condo luxury thing mm -hmm. i don't i don't someone set it up for me and contacted me that's very interesting to think about the perspective of that right so for yeah. the average chinese person staying in a condo there in china and seeing right. your work yeah totally exotic justin terry work right, right? like that's pretty interesting right like i guess i mean you know i have do no you think about <laughs> it in that way like <laughs> you're an international artist right yeah right I'm in, chi in china overseas. like showing like yeah, oh man, local condo. new york artist amazing exotic you know, yeah, it's not that we don't good. think about that way here, <laughs> but you're telling me, you know, you're selling overseas. You've, you're well, tapped into the overseas market is what I'm hearing. I'm hoping that I'll, I'll find out next week if, if I've done the work and I'm hoping that the contract I see. doesn't fall apart and cool. everything's cool. But as far as where it's going, I honestly have no idea. Mm -hmm. And mm. someone, this company here, I have like a, they're called Indie Walls. They do really cool stuff around the city where they... They kind of like they look for um, like wall space, like in hotels or nice restaurants or cafes or whatever, and they do shows up around town. And okay, it's uh, kind of like an agency for artists, like they're pushing the artists to show in the in that space. Or? Yeah, it's not really an agency. It's kind of like a small business plan for like mm -hmm. using space around town to mm -hmm. show work and help. You know, you don't have to be represented. Like it's it's cool. real casual, and they set this up. So cool. And they've been around for about two years and it's cool. They've actually gotten pretty big and they're they're growing. So did you come here from Nashville to do art, like specifically as a, m a motion? I'm coming to New York City to work on my art career. Or? Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. I, I got into Pratt for grad school. Oh, cool. And that brought me up here. And mm -hmm. I had some friends. Pratt is like six degrees here. in New York City, man. I have so many yeah. connections to <laughs> At Pratt. At least Brooklyn, <laughs> for yeah. sure. Yeah, definitely. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it was... Uh, a uh, good experience. Um, cool. I learned a lot there. Awesome. Um, and also, there's something you know, something to be said right about an artist moving to a different city and the, like the social education and you know what they get just from moving to another city. Like you're an artist, f you know, forget right. the paperwork. Like just move to another city. There yeah. you go. That's just you do know. stuff. Just do Where are you from? Okay, things. you need to go to Paris. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like. Uh, so w it, was it uh, easy for you to get out here and to start living in New York City? Or um, looking back. <laughs> Well, it was in some ways because I had a lot of friends here and it wasn't hard to adjust. Mm -hmm. But it w but when I look back, it I totally like um, adjusting to Pratt and adjusting. I got I started out as like a MFA student. Then I tagged on an art history degree while I was there. So it was like a double master's and not having been in school for a long time. That was a shock to the system. Yeah, sounds like a lot. And getting in involved with New York and seeing how they're starting to learn how the whole art thing happens here, which is completely different than any other place in the world. Yeah, you know. there's the industry as it's taught in school, and then there's like, the real let's world. go work in yeah, the industry exactly. and deal with yeah. those people. Yeah. So all that was, uh, yeah, it was a great learning experience, mm -hmm. you know. Cool. Um, awesome, man. Well, uh, I think uh, let's go through some of your, your art here. We have uh, a number of slides we're going to share with everybody at home, okay. and we're going to keep talking about them. Um, so, yeah, so what are we seeing here? Yeah, so this was a, uh, I guess I started kind of with uh, stuff I did in college. That's when I started painting. You know, I 
did a lot of art when I was young and then got away from it in middle school and high school because mm-hmm. I was just doing other stuff. Then went to uh, college and got back into it. And um, I kind of started, you know, I my work in general isn't like focused, like I'm going to go paint something specific. It kind of, it's open and I just start working and come up with things. Mm-hmm. And um, I think one of the things, the stuff up now is like, some music idols I had, you know, just musicians I really love, you know. Um, that awesome. was Thelonious Monk. This is Bob Marley. And these were stuff I did. Love Thanks. <laughs> uh, this was stuff I did in college. I was painting them a lot. So how um, big are these? Are these, is this um, these watercolor or what am I seeing? These are oil paintings. Oil? Uh-huh. The Bob Marley one was probably about four feet. This one's probably like six feet. It's a, oh, wow. Cool. It's a John Coltrane. Yeah. Um, the young John dressed to the T's. Right. <laughs> so it's beautiful. Uh, he's in this like solemn moment, his eyes shut. He's like thinking about something. Mm-hmm. Another Thelonious Monk. Cool. Uh, I think this is like after I had moved to Barcelona. Mm-hmm. And I started after, yeah, I started trying to go abstractly trying to, cause like for me, like painting is a lot about, you know, like color is a sense how we perceive it a Mm -hmm. lot like sound and like I think I had a I've always had a musical inclination but I'm always just the way I'm hardwired I do color better so Mm -hmm. I went to painting and um, when I got to Barcelona I started wanting to work abstractly you know kind of like doing like you know I like Sonic Youth and stuff like that too oh yeah Sonic Youth (laughs) Yes, we all love Sonic like Youth. So when, you know, there's these flower paintings up now, and these were kind of my first attempts at abstraction. I would okay. put a lot of stuff down, then pull these shapes out of it. Was it, what year was this? You were, I mean, you mentioned Sonic Youth. You reminded me of this New York City Ghosts and Flowers. Yeah. yeah. There was um, a Flowers was a big kind of theme on that album. This was the late 90s, 2000, when I was doing this okay. stuff. Um, and so th- that's beautiful. You're, thanks. yeah, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, and also trying to, you know, set rhythm, rhythmic structures into the uh, the work itself, too. And all this was done in Barcelona as well. So you're influenced A by the city. Of, and, yeah, yeah, exactly. Gaudi and Moreau and... She go to Park Guell. Picasso. Oh, yeah. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah. Love that. I love this love one place. a lot, this next one that's coming up. Mm-hmm. It's, um, you know, it's uh, such abstract flowers... Uh, but the colors that you use, what's, can I ask you, what's your method in this? Is this is oil as well? or? Well, these right here are acrylic. And it was, I was really starting from just a blank canvas and throwing stuff down and working the uh, form and structure out just by trying to feel it out and see where it goes, mm-hmm. you know? So, like, looking at shapes within it and then just building all those little flowers and stems and stuff, trying to make something that fits together. Right. You know? Yeah, this one's really beautiful, too. Is this all one canvas that you're applying to, or is this an assemblage? Or Yeah, so this is, again, I'm, uh, I started wanting to get away from the flower stuff and get really completely abstract. Yeah. And uh, this one was one, one of the first. You can see the, uh, I think the shapes are starting to disintegrate a little bit more. Yeah. Kind of get more like... <laughs> Yeah, so oh, yeah, it's okay. so abstract when you pull away from it, but the closer you get, mm-hmm. it's you make something of it. This this is really good. Okay, yeah, so we're yeah. we're watching the process of you going f- into right. more of an abstract kind of sensibility. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. So again, these are getting more and more abstract, and it's more for me kind of like sonic reverberations and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And this this one, I think, is the last one I have here before I went to Pratt. So the next one coming okay. up. Yeah, I love your use of color on this, just the impression. How big is this piece that we're looking at with the pink and That's the blue? That's um, a two and a half by two and a half feet. Okay. So it's not small, but it's not big either. And then the next one I was one of the first paintings I did at Pratt where, like, a teacher actually liked it. It's, um, it's, it's crazy because you <laughs> go to a place like that and it's like, 
you start seeing the political structure of the art world yeah. because every teacher starts having their own idea of what is relevant and what's a good painting yeah. and all this stuff. And what path you should take. Exactly. And, yeah. and you're, you have like five of them at once, so they're all taking you in different <laughs> classes, yeah. directions, and it kind of sucked. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But you learn a lot. This isn't exactly the master-apprentice relationship as right. I l- learned about <laughs> it. This is so the previous one was one that's that stuck together and I, I started really focusing on trying to figure out color better and not just this is really cool i i feel like i'm mm-hmm. there's so many impressions i have like i'm looking down on a, on a landscape or a map or something this yeah. is a, acrylic or this is oil this is oil so now i'm working in oil and this was wow. one of the first paintings i got where i felt like hey i'm starting to get to where i wanted to be with it okay yeah. and what are the dimensions of these these are about two by two feet okay also. Um, and I'm using different things to put the paint down, like, you know, yeah, knives, squeegees, Mm -hmm. brushes, just hard edge things, um, and just taking paint off, putting it back down, working wet into wet. Uh, this was done with a palette knife. Um, and at this time I also started naming them after days, the day that I finished them on. Mm -hmm. So it became comes sort of like more of a meditative piece towards like a anonymous day you're not Mm -hmm. trying to guide anybody towards what they're seeing in it yeah 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 exactly like keep it open and not also not you know i don't want to after i like making it but forcing a name on it doesn't sound very organic right and a lot of artists take the opposite approach of that right they're like this is the meta foundation of saturn during its third moon and you know you're like oh so and there's uh, something yeah, to ask you about that in in mm-hmm. general like how do you feel about interpretations of your work i mean because a lot of people oh. go straight for the go for it yeah. personification Whatever of the, you know i don't mm-hmm. yeah i don't have any objections to however like i i like that being open yeah so if it's open you can take from it whatever you want cool. or yeah. add to it whatever you want um so this is a larger piece. This is uh This one's always impressed me. Yeah. This one really is cool. It looks like um it's almost like a digital effect or something. This is just paint though, right? Yeah. But when I see the digital image it I- images, it looks really uh, digitally um produced to me. So that's yeah, like worked with like a probably a 12-inch squeegee type thing. Mm-hmm. The artist I really like is Gerhard Richter who Yeah, he's is amazing. Kind of, yeah, he's famous for doing these squeegee abstracts and then I started photographing details of them and turning them into like digital prints. Cool. Is that what we're seeing now? So that th- yeah, mm-hmm. that's like a detail of the previous one, and that that print is probably about twenty by twenty inches or so, but it's just a small little detail blown up. Do you have prints of that that I can mm-hmm. frame and hang on my wall? Sure. Yeah. Man. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. With you? Not. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe about in the next borough over, next right. neighborhood over. <laughs> Is this a detail as well? This no, this is uh, this is um, uh, another oil painting. It's about uh, this one is also about two and a half by two and a half feet. Um, yeah, I like Rothko a lot. Also, mm-hmm. um, Victor Rothko. There's a new. Uh, there's a Chinese artist I just found out about. Name. Um, I think I get his name right. It's Zhu Jinsi. Mm-hmm just discovered him a few months ago I works great um i'm always kind of looking at other abstract painters and mm-hmm. adding to it um another s- this one's a smaller oil yeah beautiful i love your use of color and just in the sense of rothko when you walk into a room and a rothko is there that was kind of my first lesson in how a painting can affect you emotionally without mm. being a specific content and you walk into a room with a, a, a Rothko and it affects you, you know, it yeah. did me. And, you know, just the color and, you know, how much we know these days about the brain, human brain and sensory input and, you know, how much colors can influence your emotions and such like that. Like, right. These are really beautiful. They seem really powerful, like charged with the emotion. Thanks. This, is this another detail or is this a full piece? No, how big is, is that? This is a full piece, yeah. Um, so this is a big painting. This one is uh, about eight feet, eight by six and a half feet and I did two of these together they were they hung in the uh, Nashville airport for about six months yeah these are oil all all of these are oil now 
Um, oh, that was in the airport in Nashville? Yep. Now it's in Vanderbilt's law school, hanging up there. Oh, cool. So, and this... Oh, yeah, awesome. So coming up, you'll see the next slide, I think, is... Um, this is a show I had in Nashville where you can see these two paintings hanging up. And that, that <laughs> previous one, that orangey one, is there too. Well, great, yeah. Just their so size yeah. and... Mm -hmm. Very cool. And then... What is that show? What museum was that? That is... It's at a gallery in Nashville called Zeitgeist. And it's mm. been around since the 80s. It's a pretty... It's a great gallery. The people that run it are awesome. Mm -hmm. um, these next three are details of those more... Of That's those cool. This is where it gets prints. really mysterious yeah. to me. This is really Blade Runner <laughs> and <laughs> Sam Delaney and... A lot my dream of last yeah. night. Yeah, I mean, I like you know, <laughs> I like looking at this stuff. And yeah, so I love this one too. This is really great. Up. So these are all small details blown up. They're about, I think, twenty six by twenty inches. And is this new? This series that we're looking at now, or I've had them for a while. These are off those two big paintings. These, um, yeah, they're more of those detailed prints. Yeah. If you're listening to music when you're painting? Yep. Yeah. yeah, pretty much all the time. Do you think in colors? Does the music translate into colors? Yeah, Sean's wondering if you listen to music while you're painting and if the you think in colors, does the music transition into colors I in your mind? I feel like the music gives me, like, is more of energy. And sometimes it does. So it, it, it depends what I'm listening to, you know. Like, if I'm listening to Miles Davis or something more abstract, I get more color stuff. Yeah, listen to Monk a lot. Uh huh. Cool. And then if I, you know, I love like Jack White, White Stripes. That stuff's kind of like energy that goes into the painting. Too. Yeah. So. Yeah, but I pretty much always have it. Mm hmm. Um, I'm usually just working in oils these days. Um, I like it. I feel like the way acrylic dries, it loses some of its um, color. Yeah. So I, yeah. A couple interesting, like uh, two paintings back, there was, um, I did this just by chance, uh, these three paintings, and I had two of them on there, um, that with the day MCA died, that was just kind of, a coincidence, but it was interesting hearing that news when I was working. And mm -hmm. that wasn't like, it wasn't like the, the driving force to make that work. You were working. I was working. And, and then, then that integrated into what you were doing. Yeah. But then the way I named these being on those specific days, right. it kind of, those three paintings are. That's a whole interesting, interesting conversation yeah. is, you know, how we absorb our environments as artists. Right. And whether we want to or not, that influences us. Mm -hmm. I used to, before I would perform live, this sounds totally cheesy now, and I'm ashamed to admit it, but for some reason. But uh, when I used to perform live, I would listen to Martin Luther King Jr. speak. Oh, interesting. There's something about the, the energy and, like, the importance and the meaning of what he was saying that would yeah. just amp me up. And it didn't, you know, that kind of absorbing your environment and having that influence what you do, it might not be like, oh, I'm trying to re- Right. Explain this or something. Yeah. It's But this energy influenced me this way, you know, and... Well, influence comes at you all the time mm -hmm. on so many different levels, not just direct, but like mm -hmm. subconscious levels. And, you know, it's but just know. something like that. Somebody so influential in pop culture and right. their death. And like, you know, I've had those moments with pop culture, people you don't even know, but they've influenced you. And like the, all the hairs on your arms are standing yeah. up and there's some connection to some person in history, you know. The, yeah. Sorry. These these are the two pieces that might go to China. <laughs> Oh, really? Cool. This, this is one of them. Did we miss one? Should we go back the one? Next we one, one is the first coming one. up. Okay. Yeah. This one is the second so one. Uh, just can you describe what these are? These are uh, Sure. So basically, well? this yeah, they're oil. They're four by four feet. Mm -hmm. um, there was a previous painting earlier that was palette knifed in it, same color tone. And what happened was uh, yeah. this group, yeah, yeah, it was called August yeah, 2007. Yeah. This, uh, this group, Indie Walls, had a client that liked that and they wanted me to I guess do something similar but like bigger mm -hmm. so that's what I did with those now when when someone asks you mm -hmm. can you make this how does that how does that uh, affect you as an artist well 
you know, when I've done commissions in the past, it's like I'm always flattered that people like my work and right. want me to do it. But when you're doing work like this, you also have to be pretty clear that you can't replicate a piece because right. so much of it is just by chance and working with your movement and what you're doing that day. And you can't, you know, if you throw paint down on a canvas, you can't make it do that the same way. Mm -hmm. You can work right. with like, you can't be that same person exactly. you were that it's not day. A, yeah. It's not a photograph. You can't just like mm -hmm. reprint it. So you just kind of get like, you know, like with that commission, I just made it clear. Like I can do that, you know, that, same kind of feeling in it, same brushwork, same palette, that type of thing, but it'll be a little different. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah, beautiful stuff, man. Cool. Very, very cool. Um, you have a, what's your webpage again? You want to share that with people so we can go online and look at your stuff? Yeah, it's uh, www, well, justinterrystudios.com. Justinterrystudios.com. And Terry spelled uh, T-E-R-R-Y? Yep. No, I would say the normal way. Maybe yeah. it's not. <laughs> totally. Way I expect. Right. Very cool. Cool. Well, thanks for sharing with us, man. Um, uh, love the work. It's really amazing. Um, and when can you g um, shout out your show again? When is your show? Yeah. Um, it's. I want to say it's December sixteenth. Um, but, <laughs> but it might not be. <laughs> I'm gonna say it is December sixteenth. Okay. And it will be posted on my website too. Awesome. JustinTerryStudios.com. Yes. JustinTerryStudios.com. Yeah. Check out the work. Yeah. Very cool. Thanks for joining right. us, man. Yeah, we love the work. Awesome. awesome. Justin Terry, episode 14 of Inside the Sulfur Bath. Um, almost over. Not and quite. Uh, yeah, it's almost like we got one more treat left. One more, one more little pony bit. trick. One, more one little thing. Pony with a trick. So I think that this... What, po uh, what tricks do ponies do anyway? Like, I don't know. Have you heard that phrase? <laughs> like one true. trick pony. Like what does a pony do that's a trick? Like it's yeah, I guess what? so. Is that one trick though? That's a whole series of tricks. That's things. Are you talking about a horse counting? Yeah. Is there a name for that? Do you, you know what dressage? Dressage. It's it's oh, kind of it's like, like fancy trotting. pants horses. I know trotting and things like that. <laughs> Trying. Mitt Romney. Mitt Romney. Yeah. Yeah. He had oh, a dressage yeah. You know, you know Colbert. That's why I know about it. It's Colbert. Yeah, they had they did yeah. all thing and he he, he practiced. That's the the best the thing to make fun of is. Fancy These pants Olympic horses. Olympic activities that shouldn't exist. <laughs> yeah, exactly. In my opinion. Did you know hacky sack was in the Olympics? No. Yeah, but they play with a net, and they do spikes, like where the guy flips in the air and kicks the foot bag, and it's like volleyball where they do I was spikes. Say, wait, and wait shit, are you like talking about volleyball? No, it's volley some legit, legit hacky, hacky sack in the Olympics. Hack? Check it out. It's a uh, like the Olympics. Serious the mainstream same ones sports, we're talking man. about. The the ones yeah. with the five rings and yeah. are international. I'm not talking about like Boy Scout Olympics or. AA Olympics or anything like that. I'm talking about like hippie the hippie Olympics. Some sort of other Olympics. Yeah. yeah. Olympics. Right. Well, I, I simply don't believe you. So <laughs> until you prove Well, you that. simply can get on YouTube and check it out. I will. Everyone else, check it out too. <laughs> believe me then. Cool. What a good show. Uh, tonight so, was yeah. really great. Uh, music performance by Ben Shapiro was really amazing. He's, a, he's awesome. Thanks so much. Uh, we're really pleased to have you, Ben. Thank you. And so Ben Shapiro, thank you. I also want to thank Justin Terry. Justin, your work's amazing. Thanks for coming on the show. Thank you very much. Um, I, I hope the folks at home um, could see half of what I'm sure it looks like in, in person. But, you know, go online and check out his uh, upcoming show. Um, I also want to thank Lisa McEwen. Thank you very much, thank Lisa. You. Educating us and talking about speech act theory. That was v totally very insightful, cool conversation we had. That was awesome. That's exactly the kind of thing we want uh, our episodes to go like, right? Yeah. I think out of out of all the episodes, this one has gone better than average. <laughs> Man, you just Definitely. hurt all the other episodes' Definitely feelings. Definitely better than average. It was it was excellent. Everybody. Yeah, really great job. Yeah, we should mention. I don't want to say best because that's just really that's that's <laughs> that's much more disrespectful yeah. to the other episodes. The green screen episode was pretty cool. Yeah, we had every tenth episode or something. We'll do that. Yeah, that one was awesome. Oh, that's a testament to how cool the show is, Dean. Yeah. Thanks for saying that, man. Yeah. I'm not even going to tell the folks at home what you said. I'm just going to leave it as a mystery. Yeah. <laughs> Dean just said the coolest shit you guys at home would d didn't hear and won't amazing. be able to. This is awesome. But, yeah, we'll talk about it next week on episode 15. Yeah, on episode 15 next week. So we're going to wrap up with a nice little improvised jam.
Thank you, Sean Randall with Mantle, mantlethought.org, partner to Sulfur Bath. Thank you very much, Lisa McEwen. Uh, I want to thank Justin Terry very much and Ben Shapiro. It was a and great show. And Mike Wilson. Thanks and for hosting the Mike show. Mike Wilson and Greg Becker. And um, thank you, guys. And Fumio Tashiro is going to lead us in a jam right now. And yeah, Dan go, Marco is going to join us as well. So here we go. Let's play and some improvised crazy join music. Us too, right. if you want to. Thank you, guys. Have a good week. And do something with it. Hit me with a funky beat to kick some rhymes. So please do this for GM. I'm just having a wave. And then here, your funky jam can come over here. You got a mic right there. What's that? You're assuming I know how to play the piano. He's assuming I know how to play the piano. He assumes. I know how to play the piano. He assumes I, I know how to play the piano. Not a verb. Some people just live to serve. I live to curve. I live to fly like a bird. Yeah, that rhymes, so I'ma use that word. Word. Speak on a topic. I used to think that my mind was microscopic, but now it's larger than life, and I'm feeling nice because I used to think once, but now I think twice. What does that even mean? I'm living inside a dream. I'm a human being trying to be. I'm a life beaming into your soul. I'm about to speak what I've never been told. So how do I know? It's just knowledge. Words persuade. Words sway. But it's not always what you say. Sometimes it's what you do with what you say that makes you be who you are today. Yeah. And exactly what you used to be when Ben plays the guitar and speaks like a human being, I pass the trumpet off. Then I go off like a rocket because I used to think my mind was microscopic. But let me switch the topic and drop it because now we got drums, now we got bass, now we got guitar, now we got trumpet, now we got sound so far and so close and so what it used to be and what it is now will always be what it used to be until it isn't anymore. So what is no thing when nothing is something? And what is something when I can paint with oil and express things that aren't even actual objects but abstract thoughts that conquer us all and remember that we are just human. 
I usually spit sitting down, but now I'ma stand up because everything I've heard tonight is profound. And my feet, they move me. And I used to do things that weren't always coherent to what I was as a human being, but now I believe that in the present, I will always achieve because I'm surrounded by positive energy. And life, life is just a topic to discuss because if you're not them, you're one of us. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I used to want to speak on race, but then I used to understand that now it's yesterday and yesterday is tomorrow. So why live life with sorrow when all of my time is borrowed? And God, he's the one signing the receipt. So when I spit on the beat, it's really him that will speak. Yeah. I have whiskey and four beers in me, but please don't envy because you could be in this exact predicament. You could hear what was written when sound wasn't even invented. And I'ma say this with no, with no, with no, 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 nowhere to go. Because I've already found home. And you know what? It was inside of home from the dome, next to loud sounds being shaken out of the soul of people I've met once, twice, and three times before, but at the same time, when I open the door, the only thing I should do is jump, because God already told me I'm a soul, I found the source, and I wasn't even looking for power, I was looking for a reason to knock down two towers, I was looking for a reason to divide us the color of our skin. I was looking for a reason to define life by pretend. I was looking for us when I found me. And I wasn't looking for me, but I was looking for a seed to grow a tree. Just so I could be. Yeah. Shut me all to believe. Knowledge is self because you're not about what you do tomorrow. It's not about what you did yesterday, it's what you're doing now. So if you're saying it loud, make sure you're saying it proud. Make sure you say it like you're saying it loud. So if you start to believe that you're not what you want to be, just understand that no one is because we're still trying to achieve. There's a circuit. There's a circuit being worked quick. There's a circuit being turned. There's a circuit being turned. There's a circuit that we won't see on MTV or VH1. There's a sound that just started but didn't even begun. And it's a contradiction. Wow. It's something about Dixon. When someone speaks on a podium, do we believe? No. We look beside the lines, between the lines. We find our mind and time. And time just keeps spinning because everybody knows that the beginning can also be the ending. And the ending can start something that might just start a revolution. And if you start spitting the truth, when? During Suffer Back Reduction episode 14, you might believe that you just opened your eyes and saw a dream. Because it's not about the plots that Scott, me and my Suffer Back Reduction team. People I met tonight, people I met yesterday. People that might just float away like a feather. I might just do it forever. I might just get better. I might just get clever. I might just kick it from the mind and do whatever. I start kicking that mic, I pick it up and drop rhymes. Straight from the mind, I do it all the time. I got Mike on the block, he doing his thing. Suffer Back Reduction, I'm chilling with kings and queens. On the scene, I see a bunch of things, just a dream, knock on the door, I might have to let them in so they can see shit that I saw before but still feel like it's yesterday, so I can believe in everything I say, I don't have to pray, cause God knows that I'm talking to him every day, and God knows that the flow's like H2O, let it soak in your soul and go up cause I'm bold, it's gold, I might grow from a rose, that was conjured and concurred and something that I never heard preferred might smell like herbs I'm just a bird I'm just a word I'm being ground but everything that happens around me is profound so when I get up we have to put it down and they could never lock us down what is the chain when knowledge is the key and what is struggle when I'm just being me and I don't even have to achieve I wake up every day and believe that I'ma see things that didn't even have to be a criminal nah I'm an individual, a something that could never be A symbol of positivity, love and everything in between Focus on the green, a pony component, piece of the machine Hanging with my team, suffer back productions, yes <laughs>
episode 14. I like folk music too. Folk music is awesome. I, I was sitting in this room like, I need everyone I grew up with in the hood to listen to this guy. Because he's saying stuff that we've experienced in our lives. He doesn't have the same color. Language. He doesn't have the same tone. But if he and I can see who sits on the throne, then we can influence the world with just our poems. Word. Blaine's killing it on the trumpet, just so you don't know. I love the archives, because it's like, what didn't I hear? Oh, I heard that. Nice. Sulfur Bath Production. Language.